Good morning, good afternoon, good evening um, from wherever in the world you're joining us. So I see everyone uh, trickling in. Thank you for, for joining uh, this breakout session on this, the first day of the UN Global Compact Leaders Summit. Um, we're very thrilled to have you join this particular session. Um, I'm Adam Roy Gordon, uh, the Engagement Director of Global Compact Network USA, uh, the U.S. network of the UN Global Compact. We represent the, the U.S. signatories. And I'm joined with my colleague, Ayman Chowdhury, um, who leads the Canadian network. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to quickly um, uh, provide a video uh, with some opening remarks from uh, Jim Thompson, the Director of Private Sector Engagement uh, in the Office of Global Partnerships in the U.S. Department of State. We're happy to have some governmental remarks with us, and it looks like people are really streaming in now, which is great. So I'll put on that video. Hi there. My name is Jim Thompson, and I'm the Director for Private Sector Engagement in the Office of Global Partnerships at the U.S. Department of State. It is my honor and pleasure to be able to congratulate the U.N. Global Compact on its 20th year anniversary. Over 10,000 companies into the 10 principles laid out at its foundation. These principles have been rolled down through the corporate supply chains, affecting businesses globally and improving the lives and the livelihoods of the population. Your shift from the global compact, significant progress has been made in critical areas of like human rights, labor, environment, and anti corruption. With their efforts, we now see more sophisticated approaches taken to integrating sustainability into the core business strategies and operations of corporations. Sustainability is being treated not only more strategically, but also is being treated at a much higher level than ever before. Responsible business is not only key to solving pressing economic, social, and environmental challenges that we face, but it's also vital in the element of creation of the necessary conditions for businesses to thrive in the future. Even in today's world, where we continue to fight the COVID-19 pandemic, the role of sustainable businesses contributing to development is more crucial than ever before. We thank the UN Global Compact for bringing the world together this week to address the private sector's response to the ongoing health and economic crisis. With these assembled businesses and government leaders, we're convinced that the world's most pressing problems can be addressed. The work of the UN Global Compact this week is a continuation of their important role in partnership matchmaking and helping the UN agencies meet and build partnerships with the private sector to take action for societies around the world. To the companies attending this week's virtual summit, I recommend that you check out the Global Compact Business Partnership Hub. It's at business.un.org. This is an online platform for connecting the UN and companies to companies around the world. The UN Global Compact also works closely with its local networks to build their capacity to connect local business community with local leaders at the country level. The United States commends the UN Global Compact for its leadership in building public-private partnerships across the United Nations. And thank you as well to Executive Director Elise Kingo for your leadership at the UN Global Compact for these past five years. You've made significant advances at the organization, and we've been proud to partner with you in your efforts to bring the business community into supporting global development. We wish you well in your next endeavors. Thank you. We'd like to thank the U.S. Uh, Department of State for those remarks from Jim Thompson. And with that, I'd like to hand over introductory remarks to uh, my colleague, Ayman, with Network Canada. Thank you so much, Adam. Good afternoon, everyone from Toronto, Canada. Thank you again for joining us for this North American breakout session. Very happy to partner with Adam from the U.S. Network to co-facilitate this breakout session. 
I am Ayman Chaudhary, the head of secretariat of the Canadian Network of the UN Global Compact. If your business headquarter, uh, is headquartered in Canada or it's a Canadian subsidiary, we are here to provide you all sort of support to engage with the UN Global Compact. I hope you all had a chance to listen into the morning sessions and I would like to start by echoing to the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres to raise our voices against expressions of racism and instances of racist behavior wherever we find it. Racism is an abhorrence and there must be uh, rejected at all case and there is an urgent need for leadership in recognizing and pushing back against racism, systematic, against systematic racism. Along with that, we must ensure that the measures being taken by the private sector and the government pave the way to a more sustainable economy and do not look us further into a high carbon future. We must ensure that everything that we do reflect good citizenship towards environment and human rights, labor and anti-corruption. Like all other nations in the world, in Canada as well, businesses have been significantly impacted from this pandemic and now we are looking forward to the recovery options. To find inspirations, we are currently running a webinar series titled as Business Continuity Through the Lens of Sustainability. And we already had two very successful sessions with senior corporate leaders from TELUS, BlackBerry, Transcontinental Corporation, BSF Canada, Scotia Bank, and Baker and McKinsey Canada. The webinar series recordings are available on our website, which is globalcompact.ca. And I encourage you to listen in to, our, uh, to those insights and find inspirations for your business. Also, we are going to launch another working group to have a Canadian outline for sustainable business recovery through the lens of the SDGs. The primary objective of the working group is to explore the SDGs implications in terms of risks and opportunities, definitely in lieu of COVID-19, identify concrete steps com companies can take to embed the sustainable principles into their recovery response, and finally, identify special considerations for sustainability reporting to reflect the response to COVID-19. Participation in the working group is, is eligible for any company located in Canada. If you're interested to know more, please feel free to reach out to me at Ayman, A-Y-M-A-N, at globalcompact.ca. We also have other initiatives going on for gender equality, circular economy for plastics, child rights and business principles, and for the SDGs. Would be very happy to respond to your queries about how to participate in those initiatives. We have a great panel today to discuss multi-sector approach to how North American corporate sustainability leaders are managing the continuity of their sustainability work during the COVID-19 crisis. From Canada, we have senior representatives from Nutrien and Scotiabank. And from US, we have senior representatives from Kellogg and Pfizer. The session will be moderated by Sunil Prashara, who is the president and chief executive officer of the Project Management Institute, which is serving more than 3 million in nearly every country of the world. So without a further ado, let me pass it to Sunil now. Thank you, Ayman. Can you hear yes, me? We can hear you. Good, 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 good. Yeah, I'm having a few problems here with some technology, so hopefully you can hear me. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, you all for joining us from around the world for this very important uh, conversation. I specifically would like to thank the United Nations Global Compact, Network USA, uh, Network Canada for making this discussion possible. So COVID-19 has uh, forced all of us to uh, pivot and make changes very, very quickly. But even as we respond to the pandemic, there are a range of other important issues that we must collectively continue to address, especially when it comes to sustainability. And so today we'll be talking to some very inspiring leaders and thinkers about how they are managing the sustainability in the midst of this crisis. A focus for this year's Leaders' Summit hits the nail on the head, actually. Recover better, recover stronger, and recover together. That is the goal for all of us as we look beyond COVID-19. So to briefly introduce myself, yes, I'm, uh, my name is Sunil Pashara, and I lead the Project Management Institute. Uh, we're the world's largest uh, professional association for professional uh, project managers uh, who are turning up at work every day to turn ideas into reality. And we empower a global network of these professionals who are focused on taking strategies, plans, big ideas, and actually implementing them and seeing them through. 
And what is our secret source? Our secret source is this incredible network of more than 12,000 chapter volunteers that drive our for purpose mission. In fact, last year, this community pledged in excess of 150,000 project hours of volunteer service towards the United Nations SDGs. So here with us today, we have a very impressive group of leaders from across the US and Canada to talk about how their companies are stepping up to emerge even stronger and to help build a world that's aligned to the ambitions of the United Nations SDGs. And there's been a lot of fascinating discussion on this topic recently. For example, Bain and Company released an article recently called COVID is a dress rehearsal, a dress rehearsal for sustainable efforts, an opportunity for businesses to reimagine how they can tackle a range of social challenges in the future. And Bloomberg, they published an article entitled COVID-19 may change corporate sustainability as we know it. A key premise being that companies may need to rethink corporate social responsibility. So I'll be very interested here today what our panelists think about these articles. And to get us started, let's get everybody to introduce themselves very briefly. I'll ask each of you to briefly say a little bit about yourself and your organization and talk a bit about your role and your focus, all in about, say, 30 <laughs> seconds. So let's kick it off. Uh, Amy Sentner, why don't you start us off? Thank you. Um, great to be here today. Always nice to have a warm up from Al Gore. So I'm glad to glad to, to be here. Um, I'm uh, Amy Sanders. I'm the sustainability officer at Kellogg Company. So I lead our global sustainability efforts, including our environmental um, and social efforts within our own manufacturing our supply chain, our sustainable agriculture work, um, and how we bring that to life for investors, uh, customers, consumers, and other stakeholders. So great to be here. Thank you so much, Amy. Let's welcome Chris. Chris, great. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you, Sunil. It's great to be here with you. Pfizer, as many of you know, is a large biopharmaceutical company, R&D based and we're looking to deliver breakthroughs that change patients' lives. And personally, I operate in within the frameworks of, of two familiar acronyms, the SDGs and ESG. So I focus on uh, finding ways for Pfizer to contribute to the SDGs and achieving those through partnerships with uh, civil society, government, and other organizations. And I look to see how we report on that uh, to socially responsible investors through our ESG uh, communications and performance. Great to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Next up, next up, uh, Candice, Candice Lang. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for this discussion. Um, maybe I'll just start with, you know, who is Nutrien? Uh, it's not a name or a brand that has been around or as familiar as Kellogg's and, and Pfizer and, and others. Um, we're a newly merged company um, that's less than three years old and uh, a global agricultural company. We work with uh, about 500,000 growers. Um, a large number of those are in North America, making sure they have everything they need um, to everything in terms of supplies and um, agronomic advice to grow healthy crops. And in the Text of COVID, um, you know, as, as we've been really hard to make sure they can continue to have healthy crops, so we have a healthy harvest and, and food on our shelves this this fall. Within Nutrien, I'm the vice president of sustainability and stakeholder relations, so I lead our, our global team and strategy. And like Chris, love the world of acronyms we now live in: SDG, CFD, <laughs> ESG. I could go on, but I'll pass it over to Sandra. Thank you. Uh, hi, Sandra. Is this working? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you very much for the um, the great introduction. Um, and wow, what a great uh, 
Leadership Summit so far, the bits I caught this morning. Uh, my name is Sandra Odendahl, and I am Vice President of Social Impact and Sustainability at Scotiabank. Um, Scotiabank is uh, one of Canada's uh, large banks. Um, we have 100,000 people um, through Canada and Latin America principally. Um, and uh, in my role, I am in charge of uh, global donations, so global community investment, academic partnerships, and corporate sustainability across the enterprise. Um, so my team also oversees the um, ESG reporting, um, and um, as well as um, all of our community investment and a lot of our community activities around COVID, um, and as well as sustainability-related community investments and programs. Thanks very much. That's fantastic. Thank you all very much. What a fabulous mix of uh, perspectives from financial services to FMCG to pharma to agriculture. So let's get stuck in. I've got these uh, very exciting questions. Love to get your perspectives on them. Um, let me kick off with the first one, which is around the, around the, actually the term sustainability. There are different forms of sustainability ranging from business operations to social good. And many organizations have sustainability responsibilities in terms of their social good. But where are we now? We're in a, the middle of a COVID crisis. Organizations are struggling to maintain their own sustainability, to build their own operations back up during this crisis. How did your organization remain sustainable throughout the COVID crisis, whilst at the same time maintaining your commitment to social impact? Let me kick kick that off with Sandra. Sure. Um, yeah. The um, I think that in terms of um, our approach to uh, sustainability through the crisis was it was actually a way to test the extent to which the the social part of the sustainability equation and the social impact um, areas of the SDGs were um, were front and center. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, remaining sustainable, I would say one of the things that Scotiabank did first was to look at the crisis in terms of employees, um, the business, and the community. Um, certainly, my team's role is very much around uh, interaction with the community. And um, while all those pieces are intertwined, what was very interesting was the way that our senior leadership um, looked at how we were going to show ourselves to be a company that um, took the broad lens of operations, social good, business, was we were starting with our employees. So a lot of the work um, that was done up front, um, I would say even as my team was busy looking at the COVID crisis, determining what a short and long-term strategy, for example, would be around um, supporting communities through the crisis, we, we developed it, we socialized it, we thought carefully about short and long term and maybe later on I can talk a little bit about how that worked but what was really interesting was that even once it was you know fairly uh, solidly ready to go in terms of demonstrating um, that we were there to support communities during this unprecedented time um, senior leadership took the position that's great but let's make sure that we have everything properly um, done to support our employees first. So I think there are some really interesting lessons about executing on sustainability um, and where to put your priorities, especially when there's crises around sustainability, but where to put your priorities when there are a lot of different things that need to be done. And I thought it was really interesting to see the organization double down on making sure employees were property, properly looked after from all sorts of different angles. Um, and then customers and communities um, would naturally follow. Right. And, and Chris, I think so. I think the long term sustainability, sustainability for our organization is ultimately tied and inherently tied to our social and commercial purpose, which is delivering on breakthroughs that change patients' lives. And there's no, no more relevant time than now to be successful with that commitment to society. And I think. One of the things we've tried to do um, as we've pivoted a lot of our resources, human resources and attention to finding a vaccine and therapeutics to address this 
issue um, that's affecting all of society is to make sure that we ensure the trust and confidence in stakeholders that have that they have with us uh, because that's really our our, our social uh, our social contract really is if society believes that we are you know, bringing those breakthroughs to patients we do so with leaving no one behind uh, but it's an immense challenge that the, our entire Across all functions, uh, because um, not only identifying a vaccine that can uh, or a therapeutic, that can improve, we have to figure out how to distribute it equitably around the world, and that takes all seventy-five thousand uh, employees and right. advisors. So yeah, so I guess in in the pharma sector, of course other organizations like Mayo and all with very similar, you know, alignment between the, the, the sustainability and the social good and uh, what you're trying to do as an organization. What about Kellogg's? I mean, uh, how, how did they uh, react? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's quite similar to, to Sandra in the fact that our goal, our, and this was well communicated from our CEO across our organization, we had two goals at the same time. One was how we continue to protect and invest in our employees and make sure that we have um, everything, you know, that we can think of to really support them through this time. And then second, you know, we're a global food company and food is, is essential for everything to, to run in, in crisis or not. And so how do we get food to people who need it, either through sales where there were you know, empty shelves in a lot of grocery stores and making sure that we didn't, uh, we weren't part of that. And then, you know, through food banks who were getting huge spikes in demand. Um, so through cash, through donations, how do we support? Because we, as, as a company, are committed to the SDGs, of course, like everyone else here, but particularly SDG number two around zero hunger. So, you know, we have all these amazing partnerships, a lot of subject matter expertise in everything from sustainable agriculture to food donations, um, well-being, et cetera. And so how can we put those resources to bear at the same time um, to make sure that everyone who needs food has it? And then, you know, increasingly, once we got through the first kind of big hump of, of moving our new normal in COVID, how do we think about the long-term implications? And I think that that's where we are today is continuing to demonstrate our commitment to our people and our, and our employees and, and our communities. But then what what's the new reality that we're in and how do we um, learn from from the ways of working, what worked, what didn't for this uh, last couple of months, as well as how do we use it, as you mentioned, as um, a learning for other crises that may happen in the future or, or sustaining emerging issues like right. like sustainability topics that we um, already have programs against and, and continuing to pressure test them. That's right. And Candice, I mean, just to build on that, I mean, uh, all three of you said that uh, the first priority were your, was your employees, and it was the same for the Project Management Institute as well. You know, we, we looked at employees first, then we looked at the sustaining the business, and then we looked at how we're going to emerge out of this. Candice, how did uh, uh, your role? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, as an essential service, not unlike Kellogg's and food, you know, agriculture as, a, as part of the value chain there as well, um, focused on employees and communities. But to dig a little a deeper in this question and looking at sustainability continuity during the pandemic, with the onset of the pandemic um, came an onset of a recession. And so my mind at the start of this went to, what does that mean for our entire sustainability agenda? Um, we're ramping up um, you know, our commitments and focus on that and towards you know, sustainable development goals as well. Oh, what I did a few months ago is I, I looked back at the last recession to see what happened then. And as we know, there was um, a distinction from some of our sustainability priorities with that recession. And, and it took as much as a decade to come back to the same level of urgency on some of those issues, um, such as climate and others. And so thinking about that going into this recession, you know, and wondering if we would see the same thing. And it's been absolutely fascinating, Sunil, because we have not. 
And um, there's a couple of reasons for that. I think yeah. we've got a lot of momentum um, on these issues, a lot of engagement. Um, and also you know, some companies will have a better integration. So it's not just social impact on the side, it's, it's getting closer to sustainable business. But in that, coming back to what Chris said, you know, he brought up ESG. So I did want to just touch on how that has interplayed in this um, lack of abstraction from a sustainability agenda. And ESG, as we know, of course, is the, I call it the investors like to speak about sustainability, um, the environmental, social governance um, risks. And, um, and it was just fascinating to see that uh, as we looked at it, um, the foot stayed on the pedal in terms of the focus from investors on ESG topics. Um, sentiment, if, if you haven't plugged into that being checked out, the majority um, is, is still focused on it. And coming back to something I think I'm in touched on is an organization's response to COVID itself has become an ESG topic investors are interested in. And so of course we're publicly traded. So a lot of my comments are reflective of this, but I find it fascinating because it's a game changer as a stakeholder who maybe wasn't as interested a few years ago in sustainability now is very interested in it. And the reason why is because I think the wake up call, the realization that unexpected shocks, um, risk that's a bit more dynamic and, and difficult or longer term or unpredictable are now expected um, as part of a company's ability to, to plan for and tackle. And so the pandemic itself, rather than being a distraction from our company's sustainability and ESG agenda, um, has become an accelerant or more of an accelerant. I think and hope we will see that even more broadly um, beyond, beyond a nutrient focus, Sunil. Yeah, no, no, I, I think that's a really fantastic observation and I would completely concur with that. It's kind of like, you know, um, when the pandemic hit, um, of course there were all the other sustainable, you know, much larger issues that, that people were grappling with, like population, you know, rising water levels, etc. But they were kind of like creeping up on organizations in a way and people kind of like felt, that, you know, we can do something about that over time. Whereas the pandemic hit like a you know, like a, a ton of bricks, you know, just landing there and then. And before you knew it, the whole world was like, you know, under lockdown and organizations had to pivot at the speed of light to be able to even just keep themselves going. And I think what that's done is it's it's brought a completely new perspective on how fast people will need to move. And it's also brought into light that, you know, there's, there are things that can happen in this world that will impact every single individual on this planet. And this is just one of you know, 10, 20, 30 different things that are happening right now. So I think this uh, attitude towards making the change quicker, I think COVID-19 has been more of a transformation than most CEOs and chief transformation officers ever tried to do. So totally concur with you. And just building on that, you know, going forward, I mean, there are a number of ways that organizations are going to measure themselves. It's not just going to be on the profitability and on the revenue uh, that the organization uh, delivers. It could be on their employees, et cetera. I mean, from your own perspective, Candice, you know, coming out of COVID-19, what do you think is going to be the priorities when it comes to economic value? Uh, what is your company now looking at? Is the social side and uh, the sustainability side? Yeah, it, that's a space where there's a lot of moving parts and pieces in, if you're publicly traded for sure. Um, and again, that investor perspective. So we're you know, evolving to look at, you know, we've had financial um, information and then non-financial information. I actually like to call the non-financial extra financial now because we're seeing, um, you know, sustainability reporting or sharing and disclosing information on ESG metrics is, is material in a way that it never has been before. And so we place a lot of importance on you know, not just a, a glossy sustainability report, but very, very much um, performance metrics around environment topics and social topics and governance topics on new evolving frameworks, whether that is SASB or TCFD. And so how we hold ourselves to account and how we predict 
um, that performance plays out in a material way as a company is, is really changing and evolving right now, Sunil. So um, I think we'll continue to see that over the next few years um, as it's really gained momentum in the last few. Sandra, Sandra, is that, I mean, would you concur with that? Is that happening also in your organization, a, a, a flip or a split between different types of metrics across the organization, some financial, some purposeful, some equity? Yeah, I would say um, it, similar to what Candice was saying, um, Al, she didn't, I'm not so sure she said it exactly this way, but sort of building on it is that um, our investors are continuing to ask us questions about um, sustainability issues, about ES and G, um, and uh, so yes, um, you know we're. I would say that. I mean, I don't coming out of it. I don't know because I still feel like we're in the middle of it, and hopefully not still at the beginning of it. Um, it's uh, it's anyone's guess. Um, it seems how long this is going to to last, but I think it's going to last a long time. Um, and what we are seeing for sure is the um, yeah. um that our investors and our you know our employees and clients had put forward as things that we should look at um, holistically on sustainability are really unchanged other than um, as we talked about a bit earlier a greater emphasis um, and recognition of the importance of the social issues um, I think the conversation was very dominated by climate change for a long time, um, obviously for very important reasons, and we certainly have a climate strategy and there's a lot of work underway, but I actually think that um, this crisis and the recognition of um, the social issues and how intertwined everything is has actually caused people to step back and look at um, maintaining a focus on sustainability, but maybe broadening it to to be more thoughtful about the social pieces that were um, maybe taking second, they were in second place to a lot of the environmental climate change in particular um, for the last while. So I think it's forcing us to take a bigger lens. Yeah. Talking about that uncertainty. Oh, I, I think say, Chris was going to say something. I, I, I totally agree with, with Sandra in terms of the rise of S in ESG and, and also sustainability. Um, but I think, you know, the develop, sustainable development goals, you know, were, were built with the rationale of solving complex social problems. And it included health, it included, it includes multi-sectoral interventions. Yes. And I think, you know, in the context of the U.S. and, and, and around the world, as we've seen the social issues around systemic racism rise in coincidence with um, this pandemic, um, I think that the social, you know, turning towards, uh, you know, employees' welfare, not but not but our role as a corporation in society and the role that we need to play uh, through multi-sectoral, uh, you know, partnerships and collaborations with civil society with the government is increasingly at the top top of mind, I think, for our senior leaders. Yeah, and that, I, I totally agree with you. And I think, I mean, I love the word you said, everything is intertwined, Sandra. Uh, you're right, everything is intertwined. And also, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty. We don't know whether we're at the middle uh, uh, of the pandemic right now, at the beginning or at the end. We also don't know, across the globe, by country, how the economy is going to react you know it's up and down in different parts of the world so there are a number of unknown factors and that and that's difficult for organizations that are, are driven by you know a, a, a periodic performance metric which says every quarter you have to you know deliver x amount of revenue etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's becoming extremely difficult to predict what an organization uh, should be doing in such a dynamic environment so i mean this is really a question to you amy you know, how is your organization trying to manage the desired outcomes that uh, you're trying to achieve in this really volatile, unknown, interconnected uh, environment where you don't really know what's happening with the, with the economy? And you don't really yeah, know what's happening. Yeah, I think, I think it's a great question no one has the answer to. I think our goal um, 
and it sounds like across the board here is first recognizing and understanding the complexity of the issues. Um, we've been on that journey for a while, and I will add on to Candice's um, chat com conversation here. I, I was going to respond to Marissa here as well, is that, you know, for those of us who sit in larger organizations, like we all do, we have teams who are subject matter experts on these topics. They spend time, deep dives on the interconnected relationships between, um, you know, uh, inequity and food access and climate change. Those things can be very disparate issues if you're not familiar with why they're all very interconnected. Um, and so, you know, I think what you're, you'll see is those that have larger teams, um, those who can have the luxury of having people who are dedicated thinking through are able to start to be leaders in this space carrying the conversation like we're having now, um, trying to help and, and it's important that we all use our voice and, you know, I'm part of the same um, alphabet soup that Candace uh, walked through earlier with TCFD and ESG and all of those things, you know, how can we use our voice to advocate for these issues and how we address them um, in a holistic way, importantly, because that's the only way we're going to make change, but also with agility. So I think that's the one thing that Kellogg is always working on is how can we be more agile, um, take in new information as it comes, because the information is changing every week, it feels like. Um, and how does that help, um, you know, how do we balance having a clear and strategic purpose while adjusting for realities that are changing across the globe every day? So I think that's one way that we're really trying to, to, to manage through that and be as transparent as possible. So do all the reporting that we can. We do all of the reporting, have conversations like this one, have conversations with investors, learn from each other, um, because this is something that nobody can kind of crack on their own. So um, we think it's a competitive advantage, all of the work we do, but the underlying science, the, the communication, that's all part of um, how we do business uh, the right way. Yeah, and Chris, I mean, in, in your organization, similar question, really, you know, um, everything's connected. It's unknown. Uh, you must be, your organization must be getting phone calls from everyone saying, hey, you know, when are we going to come up with a, bio, uh, you know, a vaccine? When are we going to have some treatment? You know, the pressure must be huge beyond just the, the commercial pressures from your stakeholders and your shareholders. Yeah, no, How it's definitely a lot of, a, a lot of uh, scrutiny and, and, um, it's a great um, responsibility that we have. And I think serendipitously, we had a change in our senior leadership and our CEO uh, about a year, a little over a year ago. And he came in with a, a mindset to make it a more nimble, flexible, agile organization to make, be able to make decisions more quickly without a full set of information at your disposal. Um, and I think that it's, we've had a year of practicing uh, that right. type of culture change. And I think it couldn't have come at a better time because we do have to respond so quickly to very little information um, that, you know, luckily we, we started down that path, um, you know, with enough lead time so that we are able to be making some of these decisions and pivoting very quickly uh, that in, in a way that I don't think we could, you know, could have done five years ago or three years ago. Um, so I think that's one big change. Another is that we've been very um, focused on getting our position out early uh, in terms of what we stand for, what our responsibilities are, what our commitments are, uh, even in the face of the unknown. You know, we don't know if we'll have a vaccine, but if we do, then here's, you know, how we're going to be um, to, to, distributing that vaccine equitably. So just being very clear and transparent right. with where we stand even before we know all the answers. One of the, one of the things that, uh, um, that we discovered at the Project Management Institute is that 
because many organizations uh, were caught a little bit by surprise by the speed uh, of change that took place and the impact that it had, not only on the economy, but also social unrest and all these other things that are going on, which are kind of like linked to this, that uh, coming out the other side of, of uh, COVID, and we will come out the other side of COVID, organization will be very, very different. And I think, you, uh, Amy, you nailed it when you said, you know, organizations need to be far more nimble far more agile and within PMI we're actually saying organizations need to be almost gymnastic in the way that they can respond to the you know what, what hits them what comes around the corner that they can't predict you know and gymnastic meaning that they need to have a structure of course they do but they need to be trained and ingrained in able to be able to move and pivot at pace and do it elegantly so they look like they're in control and I can't think of a better word than gymnastic you know and that actually brings me to uh, another uh, final question, really, around uh, the fact that there are 17 uh, SDGs and they do cover lots of different areas and each one of them can have a material impact and they are interconnected. And as your organizations emerge at the other side of the pandemic, what is going to be your focus? Are you going to focus on a, a, a basket of the SDGs or are you going to pick one or two and say, you know what, I'm going to make a difference in that specific one? What do you think is the right thing to do for organizations now and at the same time juggle the fact that you know you can't boil the ocean you're coming out of a covid crisis where you've probably eaten into a lot of your reserves you the the old adage of if you're going to fail fail fast is now slowly you know not as relevant because people don't want to fail anymore they, they need they don't have the resources to have another go what are you going to do are you going to go for a portfolio uh, of SDG impact, or are you going to pick one or two and say, right, that's where I'm going to make a difference? Sure. Kind Thanks, Sunil. Um, uh, I, I love this question, actually. Um, and I, I think about the SDGs and how a company works with them in terms of a bit of a... So when uh, they first came out, I think we saw companies um, map the, the great little icons to their strategy and kind of an after the fact movement just to make that connection. And then as uh, we've seen, you know, actually through Global Compact and others, going that, that next level deeper into looking at the metrics and actually figuring out how you're gonna move the needle. And then in that phase, you sort of get a bit lost because they're so interconnected and there are a lot of SDGs that you bring that forward and to the next stage, I call it stage three, which is, where as a company you develop your own impact thesis or an impact theory or an SDG roadmap and and coming back to Amy's comment that's where you go how does our purpose as a company really connect to and move a big rock with the SDGs so we're both part of the the same value chain so we're partnering up on SDG too right <laughs> yeah <laughs> too. And, and it's in this stage really where I think before this stage you have a lot of stakeholders who would really want companies to be focusing on the SDGs. Once you get to, I'll call it stage three, and you have an impact thesis for theory, this is where we're gonna start to see investors enter the picture. And I know I'm on an investment theme today, but it's really the game changer for sustainable business, I think. And it's early days, um, but we're seeing, you know, it's it's Bloomberg mapping revenues to core It's SP Global um, having a new right. SDG data tool and benchmarking alliance that's going to formulate and, and say these are the companies that are actually putting the rocks in these areas, you know, food and agriculture and SDG2 being one of them. And, and that'll help transition us into that final stage where really we have all stakeholders aligned and invested in moving the SDGs forward. Um, and capital flowing into those transformations as we need it to. And, and to come full circle back to our other question, then the value of that extra financial or non-financial um, data and performance matters just as much as the financial. And we have this complete picture and really an integrated approach to sustainable business. So um, where Nutrien is at on that, we're actually just trying to get clarified clarification internally on how are we going to state our impact thesis or our impact theory on SDG2 as a company and and how does our purpose um how does that really bring our purpose to life as well so well i'll maybe pause there sunil but i think it's a fascinating um sort of progression of true integration of the sdgs into business 
Yeah, no, no, I, I see that, and I can see. Yeah, how it's going to evolve. Uh, I guess in terms of your question on, you know, how does this play out post pandemic? Um, I think um, I don't think we're going to change our approach, um, but. I think the amount of information we have to inform, you know, where we prioritize is now much more, was much deeper. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, uh, in terms of the sort of the sustainability or the community investment strategy taken, and, and I'm relatively new in the organization, uh, I'm seven months, half of that time under lockdown. Um, so you know, we've been, we were taking a good hard look at strategy um, anyway, um, in terms wow. of the enterprise's strategy around this stuff, but also my team's strategy and approach. So, you know, the social impact and sustainability, as well as the, what does the organization do? Things that is uh, one of the principles that, that's important for me is the problem you're trying to or what problems you're trying to solve. Um, so, you know, agreeing on what it is we want to accomplish, and I think Candace touched on this a bit, you know, if we're agreeing on what we want to accomplish, I don't think it's changed. I think our insights on what works, what doesn't work, and how hard we have to press on some of these things is much deeper because of the pandemic. So an example of that, I don't think we're going to back down at all on our you know, our climate change strategy. And we launched climate commitments, um, right. you know, back in November. We have targets around um, uh, what we're doing in operations, what we're doing in financing, um, what we're doing to inform internally and externally, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think that's changed at all. I would say one insight that maybe is my personal insight on this, having worked in uh, the sustainability file for a long time, is seeing how hard it is and what kinds of disruption um, happened in order to knock emissions down. Um, obviously, uh, we have some really, everybody in the world has aspirations about lowering the, you know, the carbon in the economy. I think what one thing that this has shown us is, you know, we did that um, in the last few months, but we don't really want to do it that way <laughs> going forward. So a lot of our goals and a lot of the things that we've been trying to do, um, we really need to think about that interconnection between if you say you're going to push hard on achieving this is what you want to accomplish, back to that oh my gosh, what does that mean for the, you know, the less, the more vulnerable people in society? If you start pushing hard on one goal, what happens to this other thing? It's a bit of whack-a-mole, right? Um, so I think that we're going to go about yeah. our strategy with a m much more information and much greater desire to see what happens if you push hard over here and what does it do over here? And have we completely uh, informed ourselves about all of the moving pieces and we don't solve one thing and create another problem somewhere else? I don't know if we had that big of a right. lens. It was more theoretical before and now we see it. Yeah, I think that, I mean, talking from a PMI perspective, we don't have the scale uh, as an administration function, uh, whilst the community that we look after is huge, you know, three million odd uh, project managers around the world, we as an organization is actually quite small. So the resources that we have uh, is very difficult for us to be able to focus on all 17 um, SDGs. So we individually are trying to do our bit in one or two, but our community is is spread across all, you know, all 17 and more, you know, um, and they try to do make a difference with their organizations or individually across all of them. But I think depending on the scale and size and the resources that you have, once you've managed to um, ensure that your employees are safe and two, that your your organization is now sustainable and can continue post COVID because many organizations are struggling just there, then you can start to say, OK, what can I now do to uh, to make a difference uh, on the sustainable side? Because if your organization is not a going concern, you can have as many ideas as yeah. you want. You just can't deliver on them because your organization is just, you know, uh, is in trouble because of COVID. So 
I think in terms of priority, looking at our organization, obviously employees came first, then we had to make sure, are we still going to be around, you know, when COVID disappears and we can stand ourselves back up again? And then, okay, where are we going to make a difference now uh, from our side? I, um, I'm going to, I'm going to um, stop there and just start to talk a little bit about, you know, I'll close out a little bit. And it's been an incredible, incredible discussion. You know, we are living in this really uh, crazy uh, period right now where it is really unknown what is going to happen over the course of uh, the next 12 months, especially when it comes to COVID, whether it's going to be a second wave or a third wave, whether we're going to have a vaccine or not, what are going to be the implications for individuals, what does it mean for business, is it going to be a, a quick recovery, recovery for the economy or is it going to be a protracted long-term burn that we're going to uh, impact, depending on who you talk to, you get different opinions there, notwithstanding what's happening on the social unrest side and, and human welfare, et cetera, as we go along this, this crazy journey. Uh, the, the one thing I'd like to uh, really ask if you could share with us all is if there was one or two things that you would want this community who's been listening in on this call to take away from our discussions today. Amy, why don't we kick off with you? What would be the one or two things that you would want people to reflect on so um, it's a good question. I think there's there's maybe two things. One is I think um, one of the things we actually talked about, and we have one that we didn't talk about, but I'll make a plug for. Within what we did talk about, I think looking at how you map your stakeholders, and this is to Candace's point especially, how and I'm sorry, I'm going to go to a feedback from someone line. Apologies, but um. You know, to Candace's point, you we have this growing interest and support from investor community, a lot of um, willingness and engagement from leadership coming out of this. How can we engage and and leverage this new focus um, as we go forward and do that through financial and non-financial or extra financial disclosure, um, continue to kind of um, press forward in a unique way with agility, um, and everything else. So I think that's, you know, a call to action is now's the time to get after it. We're looking at that ourselves. People are heightenedly aware of personal health, planetary health um, values and, and how that comes to be. And I think that this is a time to put the foot to the gas and, and go. The one other thing that we didn't mention, but it was in the comment section, is a, po a focus on um, human rights and and people in the intersection here. Like Chris, about a year ago, we set our new sustainability commitments. So we, um, as part of a broader uh, set of commitments, and we purposely made our goal about people. How many better days can we drive for people? And so, um, you know, all of our work on climate, on well-being, on um, our philanthropy efforts, translate into the impact that we're having on on people and so i think that that is uh again heightened awareness right now how do you look not about tactics but about impact um and so that would be my other kind of ask to to the community is how do we look at impact rather than just activity as part of our goals Uh, so then, do you, okay. I think he is having some sort of. I was okay. having a problem technically. My apologies. Uh, I was going to say that's uh, that's great, uh, Amy. Um, Candice, from your side, a couple of takeaways. Yeah. Well, I think that the biggest takeaway, um, you know, related to our topic, sustainability continuity, is that um, a theme here would be that. Um, paradigm shifts already in motion are, are going to be, you know, there's going to be stronger, a stronger drive behind them because of the pandemic as opposed to the distraction um, from the pandemic and recession, you know, with those agendas. Um, so I, I believe the world's not going to, going to waste this crisis. And to kind of pick up on Amy's point, the call to action, um, you know, I bring forward a comment from this morning's, um, session on, on leadership for the SDGs. Leaders need to pivot, at, or if they're already pivoting, great, on the right skill set and mindset to have for these paradigm shifts. So yeah. 
you know, I think it was Sandra, you hit on one of my favorite sayings, which is do not take a whack-a-mole approach to solving for the SDGs. You <laughs> be a systems thinker. And if you're not, you don't have the right skill set. So I just wanted to highlight that as a takeaway, because I hope people didn't miss that. I love that point. And mindset, and um, just on the ESG thing, leaders need to get on the bandwagon of knowing how to deliver value in our new world. And it, it is different. Um, delivering value for shareholders. I know we talk about the end of shareholder pri primacy, but value to shareholders is going to look different because of the sustainable development agenda. And uh, so the around that, I think would be another takeaway and, and I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Sunil. Oh, fantastic takeaways for sure. Um, Chris? Sure, so I think there are three, three big ideas that I went into the SDG era uh, back five years ago. One was that all the SDGs are interconnected. That many of us have, have talked about that today, but I think it's even more apparent today that you know health relies on you know that there's no poverty, and if you're unhealthy, you're not going to be able to uh, get the right education. That you know you're not going to be able to um, you know develop innovations and 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 contribute to economic growth. So I think that's fundamentally the same as it was five years ago, that we have to have these interconnectedness. I mean, we can't, we can't address all 17 at once, but we have to see the, the relationships and the correlations between the different goals and targets or else we won't achieve any of our, our individual goals. Well, SDG three, health and well-being is, you know, our primary focus. We have to make sure that there's clean water or else, you know, we're not going to be able to have people taking our medicine. So there's right. there's interconnectedness that we have to remember. Number two is, you know, we have to continue building bridges between the private sector, government, and civil society. More than ever, we can't do this alone. And I, we spent the first five years, I think, build trying to build that trust between the three sectors. And now, I think, aptly in our decade of action, we have to act on it. We can't just be, you know, doing pilots and and doing a lot of talking between these sectors. We have to be working together. And that's what I'm gonna be focused on is just trying to put things into action. Um, and third, you know, I had a set of seven of the 17 goals that we had, you know, gone through that process and said, well, what's probably most important if we can't focus on all 17? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think one of the things when I went to review those seven today, it was that we didn't have SDG 10 around reducing inequalities as part of that seven. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to double down and make sure that that's part of all of our strategies going forward. I certainly agree with that one. Sandra. Hey, well, I think everybody's covered my uh, my points, but I'll uh, quickly run through. I had my things were, I think, um, were said, but um, just to paint my own uh, sort of uh, perspective on them. So number one, um, I think Chris just said this, I think that um, this pandemic has really illustrated the importance of uh, a strong public sector, um, working with the private sector and working with the not-for-profit sector. Um, certainly, um, uh, you know, I mean, I probably don't need to give examples, but absolutely shone a light on the fact that the places that um, really were able to address these issues, had those those pieces working well together. And, um, you know, to the extent that any of the, the parts are not functioning well, it's really difficult um, to get things done. So collaboration is so important among a public sector, private sector, and not-for-profit. Um, the second piece we talked about is, you know, um, ba basically paying more attention to the social parts. So, economic inequality, discrimination, all those things that we learned exacerbated the impacts of, of the pandemic. Uh, that, that's true for a lot of other issues as well. It's true for climate change. It's true for a whole bunch of things. And that leads to that interconnectivity um, piece, which is the last piece. And that is that 
as we're looking at these issues, um, yes, there's 17 SDGs, they're all connected. And I think the lesson to me is that when you look at um, what are the what is the change you want to make, what are the impacts you want to have with your programs, you have to look through a broad geographic, temporal, so short term is nice, but is this a lasting change? Um, and then obviously across the E, the S, and the G, and across different parts of society. It makes addressing sustainability a lot more challenging, but obviously more effective and sustainable in the long run and you know one of the last lessons I would say that's true on certainly was apparent on the COVID file it's true of climate change and other environmental issues is um, it's really important to understand the big picture because you know just because you try to ignore mother nature does not mean she's not going to try to kill you um, and so we really need to make sure we're taking a, a broad lens um, when we that's really all I've got to say. I think we're at two. Yeah, yeah no, I, no, no, that's very, very good. And uh, in closing, I think that fantastic discussion, you know, I think that, uh, you know, obviously COVID has, has really helped sharpen people's minds uh, about, you know, how we go forward, uh, what it is that we want to focus on, why we need to focus on it. Uh, certainly for me, I, I've been, you know, super impressed that, there's, that there remains absolute clarity and sense of purpose and intent um, to really, you know, address these very important issues around sustainability in a, in a world that's, that's very volatile right now. One of the, uh, I guess we're a bit out of time, but the, the, the area that, that, that concerns me a, a little bit is execution. Now, how are we going to actually do this? Because now we're moving to a world where, you know, everybody is going to be going through transformation and change and we at the project management institute you know we do quite a lot of research into execution and, and performance etc and it's it's a very sad state of affairs that um, when you look at transformation the world wastes two trillion dollars a year on failed transformations so you might have as much intent and focus and purpose and identified you know the areas where you want to focus and, and have an impact and you may have the resources to do that but even still you find the situations where you can't because projects fail and the work fails even though the intent and everything is there That's, it's a whole new topic on its own but i think getting us to that point where absolutely you know uh, i see the intent continuing if anything more focused much more sharper much more nimble um, it, it's been a wonderful discussion, and uh, I'm going to hand back over to Eric. If you wanted to carry on, I'd yeah, to, but, uh, I'm not sure if we've got time. Uh, I would like to thank Candice, Chris, Sandra, Amy. Wonderful discussion, really good. And you can see the synergies across the, all four of you, regardless of industry, regardless of location, regardless of gender. You know, uh, we touched on a lot of topics, so uh, thank you so much for that. And Eamon, back over to you. And apologies that you couldn't see me uh, once again. Tech issues here in the UK with uh, connectivity. But, no, thank uh, you so much, Sunil, for preparing those great questions that helped to great, uh, kind of bring out those uh, very timely insights from the corporate leaders we have on the session today. Thank you so much, Amy, Candace, Chris, and Sandra for your time today and for sharing those uh, very useful insights. Pretty sure the audience uh, got a bit of help from the points that you have mentioned, and we are really looking forward to a sustainable recovery. Thank you so much again for your time today. Unfortunately, Adam had to step out to moderate the next session on the investors' perspective. So, on behalf of Global Compact Network US and Global Compact Network Canada, I thank you again, and I hope you will be uh, remaining staying with us for the rest of the sessions. Have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. It was nice to meet everybody as well. Thank you. Thank you.